All right, everyone, uh, for the final time today, because I promise you that at tonight's reception, uh, there will be no speeches. Uh, this is the final time of the day for our final day of the conference um, that I need to call you to attention and to introduce you uh, to some of our distinguished speakers. Um, a little bit of the behind the scenes here. Um, I threw a bit of a Hail Mary out into the world when we were designing our agenda. I said, what would I really like to see? What is going to highlight the themes and the idea that we are trying to focus on at this event? And I said, I'd like to get two of the biggest most important satellite companies out there to talk about space sustainability. Instead of to talk about what we're competing or the market we're building or all these other really important things, I want to say, well, what do, we, what do we think? What do we agree on? And maybe not always agree, but what can we all say as an industry that is the most important? And one of the things we say at Secure World is that space sustainability, in theory, is something we can all agree on. There's nobody out there who's going to say, oh yeah, who cares, you know, it's not my problem 50 years from now. I mean, we understand that this matters to everyone. But one of the things we're trying to do here is to say, well, what does that actually mean? What are we doing? Are we addressing those problems? Are we addressing them fast enough? What should be our priorities? And you heard from so many speakers over the last few days about their ideas in so many areas. And so today, I'm really happy to conclude with a panel where we're going to dive a little more deeply into how these two companies, both of whom have expressed such a commitment to this idea, but are operating in a complex, evolving set of circumstances, and honestly get a lot of questions about what that means. And so I hope we're going to be able to answer some of those questions and spark some debate today um, moving forward and thinking about what that looks like. So I couldn't be more pleased to be hosting our closing keynote, which is a fireside chat with Julie Zoller the head of, regula of Global Regulatory Affairs from Amazon Project Hyper, and with Maurizio Venotti, the VP of Space Infrastructure Development and Partnerships at OneWeb. So welcome to both of you. Thank Good you, afternoon, Crystal. Everyone. Excellent. I know our audience is really excited to hear from you, so we are just going to dive right into the questions. Uh, quick reminder, we will save some time at the end for some audience questions, just like we've been doing throughout. So those of you online, as well as in our audience. Don't forget to log into your app into the correct session. Start getting your questions in. Uh, we will be looking at those momentarily. So to start, Julie, this is the last session of a two-day summit focused on global priorities for space sustainability. How would you characterize Project Hyper's views on this issue? So just generally, what do you think? Space sustainability is critical to Project Kuiper. It's been a priority from, from day one. We chose our constellation design, our satellite design, and our operational plans based on space sustainability. Uh, in terms of constellation design, our orbital altitudes are 590, 610, and 630 kilometers. We will actively use propulsion to deorbit our satellites at the end of mission life. And if for some reason there's a failure of the propulsion system, atmospheric drag will bring our satellites back to Earth. We're also planning to operate our satellites with a narrow orbital tolerance. And we heard earlier in the week how important that is in terms of the space environment. Um, on satellite design, I mentioned we have a, a propulsion system but we've also designed our components to withstand impacts from small debris, and we use shielding to shield the most sensitive components like propulsion tank and batteries. Um, our propulsion tank is designed to leak rather than to burst if there should be an impact. We have redundancy on our satellites, so critical systems um, are made redundant, so if one version fails, the next picks up and, and takes over the mission. And finally, on operational plans, we're going to do active collision avoidance throughout our mission life, from launch and early orbit, through operation, and then deorbit. We will be doing active collision avoidance. Wow, that was a, a fairly in-depth overview of, of what you're planning. So thank you. That was a great way to start off. You're welcome. 
Um, I want to turn to Maurizio now. Um, can you share with us how OneWeb sees this? What is your perspective? And, and I don't know, I'm going to challenge you to, to be as forthcoming and, and thorough, I think is a good way to put it. Um, what do you guys plan? So, Crystal, we take um, our responsibility to space commons extremely seriously. And uh, this has been our mantra since the inception of uh, OneWeb, since really day one. And uh, the first aspect is that uh, we really strive to create a safe environment for industry, for the operators, and for um, people on Earth. So we're really trying to um, execute to, to our commitment. So it's not just a nice narrative, you know, uh, PR messages, but uh, our satellite since day one has been designed for the highest level of uh, reliability. Uh, using a uh, use and abuse sentence, you know, for us, failure is not an option, really, because uh, we cannot rely on the atmospheric drag for the satellites, you know, to re-enter the atmosphere at the end of life. So, um, not only we have the highest level of reliability to ensure a controlled deorbiting, but we also design for the worst case scenario when satellite, you know, could become, for whatever reason, uncontrollable. And uh, I think we're going to discuss about, uh, about this later. But in particular, about, uh, you know, um, uh, acting uh, and not just talking, you know, we really look at uh, um, space sustainability in, in six macro areas. So there's an element related to uh, space situation, uh, uh, SSA, space situation assurance, uh, space traffic management is the, the second key element. So first of all, knowing if you have a problem and then acting upon the problem you have. So every day we receive an average of 50,000 messages, uh, out of which normally is about uh, eight that we are really actively looking at and sometimes we have to maneuver and, uh, and sometimes it's just coordination and, uh, and, uh, and, and nothing has to be done from an operational level. Then we have uh, ADR, so missions like the one that uh, we'll be doing together in partnership with Astroscale, that's the third area. Uh, the fourth and fifth area are very, very close related and are uh, uh, the relationship that we have with the uh, radio astronomy and with the optical astronomy community. And uh, last but not least is, uh, uh, is a carbon footprint assessment. So in uh, 2019, we launched a nice unsolicited assessment of the carbon footprint of uh, our generation one um, supply chain. Uh, obviously, you know, launches aside that are not particularly, particularly green, but it's something that uh, we're gonna use as, um, as a benchmark for our internal purposes uh, uh, for, the, for the next generation and uh, for uh, trying to be as responsible as possible, as green as possible, also from a supply chain industrial perspective. Yeah, it's an interesting note to leave on in terms of, are we a responsible space entity, but then also what does that look like in terms of how we operate on Earth? I mean, maybe we'll come back to that. I'd like to hear more about that. Um, so both of your companies have made, as you said, it's not just PR, we, you've made commitments to acting as responsible stewards of Earth and space. That's how Kuiper has stated it and being dedicated to responsible practices on the basis that space is a shared natural resource. That's from OneWeb's website. Um, recognizing that the orbital environment is a shared one, and I am not gonna get into all the various ways you can describe that, we're gonna go with shared one. How are your companies working with each other and with other companies um, and other users of space uh, to ensure that those responsibilities are actually upheld? Um, I'll start with you, Maurice. Yeah. Okay. So from our perspective, coordination is key. And uh, um, we've been covering a lot of ground over the, the last few months. Um, we are you know, actively working and coordinating with uh, our fellow operator Starlink. We started the journey with uh, Project Kuiper and um, we recently um, signed a contract with the Leo Labs for you know, space nutrition awareness uh, and uh, safe operations monitoring. Uh, we're also um, uh, sharing uh, data uh, from, from what we see in, uh, in space in terms of uh, um, GPS interference, GNSS interference in general. And uh, last but not least, just uh, a few days ago, we've um, announced is uh, the next step of the cooperation with the Astroscale, um, UK Japanese company for um, uh, in orbit servicing uh, for our satellites. So we really, really uh, keep, and I actually see these, I'm not saying this is just one web that does it, but I also see these 
honestly from the fellow operators because the, the last thing that we all want is, uh, is an accident because that wouldn't pay dividends for, for anyone. So really, really praise to the cooperation that uh, we've been witnessing. Yeah, I mean, we're, exactly, it has to be sustainable. Absolutely. What about you, Julie? Completely agree with Maurizio on the need for coordination and, and our FCC license rightly requires that we conduct such coordination with other operators in our orbital vicinity. It's important that we share ephemeris data, covariance data, what our planned maneuvers are. We need to know where each other is, where we're going, and, and what we're planning to do at any moment in time. You talked about the number of data messages you receive per day. It's, it's astonishing. And it's, it's important to, to develop norms um, so that we can streamline and simplify this process. I think that civil government has a convening role to play in helping to do that. I, I know that when I was at NTIA, National Telecommunications and Information Administration at Department of Commerce 10 years ago. NTIA convened a number of multi-stakeholder processes with industry to come out with standards. And one particular one that I remember was um, a process on consumer privacy bill of rights and how industry would be implementing that on mobile apps took a year, but it was quite successful. And, uh, and that convening role, a multi-stakeholder process, is so important to coming to a good outcome. Excellent. Um, I want to do a follow-up here. So we, we want to get into some of the harder questions. Um, you know, one example of a shared use that raises a lot of questions and attention is the potential interaction between larger constellations and astronomical <laughs> and astronomy um, observation capabilities. Um, how are your companies interfacing with that community to address that concern? Great question. It was not long after I started at Amazon that the first articles came out about the reflectivity issues. And then the astronomy community reached out to us, uh, thankfully. And we've been engaged ever since. We participated in the SATCON 1 and Dark and Quiet Skies conferences as members of the, the conference, learning about the issues. And at SATCON 2, a uh, member of my team co-chaired the in industry working group and then became chair of the industry working group at Dark and Quiet Skies. Now, the IAU Center for sustainability has been stood up and my team is co-chairing the industry working group there as well. So we're very committed to working with the astronomers on this issue. We'll be launching two prototype satellites later this year and we're putting a sun shield on one satellite and not on the other, so we can compare and contrast the difference between an unshielded and a shielded satellite in our very first launch. So we're excited to get data on that and to find out what we can do next. Yeah, it's such a great way. That's a great point, right? Like we, we have concerns, but we need to really understand exactly what the options are. So that, that's some, some exciting information. Uh, what about OneWeb? So it's, um, it's fascinating. I was just thinking about it when, when Julie was, um, was talking. Uh, you know, up to 10 years ago, this, this was a non-existing problem. And actually, uh, people were looking for satellite flares uh, on, on the internet. Everyone was excited about the satellite flares. And, uh, and now, with large constellations being deployed, actually, uh, a complete different angle is, um, is being presented to look at, uh, at these kind of you know, potential potential now challenge and potentially an issue in the future. So uh, we had a similar you know, journey to uh, regarding the participation to the SATCON 1 and the Dark and Quiet Skies Working Group and an active participation with Julie's colleagues for the, in, in the SATCON 2. 
we have an open channel communication with the Royal Astronomical Society and the American Astronomical Society, but what we also launched recently, and recently is in the last, the last, uh, last 12 months, is um, an active observation campaign that is looking at uh, uh, measuring the brightness level of um, our satellites in, in the dark skies. Essentially, it's uh, um, taking, a signature of, uh, taking the signature of our satellites in space in order to assess the brightness level. This is uh, um, not just done, uh, again, as a, as a PR stunt, uh, uh, because unless you act on these things, there's very little advantage in measuring the brightness level of your own satellites. So the approach that we've been uh, implementing is that uh, we're doing these observations in order to correlate the observations with a mathematical model that we've been developing. Um, the mathematical model takes um, a geometrical model of the Generation 1 satellites and aims at correlating predictions, simulated predictions, with uh, measured results. So why we're doing that? Because in the end, what we want to do is we want to develop a tool. So once we've proven that the tool works through the correlation, we're going to be using this tool in order to um, optimize the design of the future generation of our satellites in order to have a uh, ideally a lower impact uh, in the dark skies. Actually, we would like to do more, so we are in discussion with um, uh, uh, the scientific community in, in the US. We would like to share the code with them uh, so they can help us to, to improve it and make it better, and uh, ideally we would like to, to make it you know, publicly available because it's something that could be uh, used for the community and not just for one web. Oh, wow, that's exciting. Um, all right, I'm just gonna keep plowing through because I have a lot of things I wanna talk to you about. Um, okay. So Maurizio, one of you mentioned it earlier, you have been talking about the possibility of active debris removal as one important yeah. method that your company is using to ensure that failed satellites can quickly be removed from low Earth orbit. Um, can you tell us more about your plans in this area? Um, you know, share some of the details. And I'm also trying to get at, you know, how do you see this technology developing in the future? How key is this to sort of your company being sustainable? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, since day one, uh, our constellation, our infrastructure has been designed, you know, taking the worst case scenario in mind, right? So, the point where the satellite could, be, could become uncontrollable. For this reason, uh, the first initial batches of our um, uh, constellations are flying what we call a grappling fixture that is compatible with uh, a robotic arm docking system. And uh, uh, from batch three onwards, we've been flying what we call a magnetic plate for uh, magnetic docking. So um, this is just to give an idea that you know, since the inception, uh, we've been uh, looking at uh, um, a very, very responsible design for, for our satellites. But we're also doing more. So through um, a partnership program uh, that we've initiated with uh, the European Space Agency, uh, through phase one, we did initial scouting of candidate technologies, and now in phase two, we selected for a partnership, AstroScale in the UK, to develop um, a mission together with them to test the technology, doing a real docking and the deorbiting of, uh, of, one of, uh, of one of our assets. So, Looking at technology, what's really important is we are trying to act uh, as, um, as a catalyst of a chemical reaction that would actually um, prove useful not only for one web but for, for the community as a whole. Um, and also we are trying to, um, to incentivize diversification because the last thing we would like to see is, uh, is a monopolistic scenario because that wouldn't, wouldn't help really anybody. And last but not least, in particular for this um, new uh, business for uh, orbit servicing missions, what is really key is not just the technological advantage, uh, advancement but uh, also the advancement on the business model which is, um, is new and is a new chapter really that has to be written for the space industry. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, the tried and true engineering, you know, we're, we're building the train as it's moving, but in, a, in almost a positive way, like we're, we're testing in real time. I mean, it's exciting to hear that you're planning for that and we're, we're gonna get to see sense. that. Um, not in a case that it must happen, but that you're actually looking to confirm, you know, how yeah. that's gonna work. Um, I wanna look at another area uh, of space sustainability. So for Julie, Another important area is um, safe space operations, is collision avoidance. And, and you've both referred to that as, as something that, you know, is obviously of concern. Um, no one wants to see that, as you said. Uh, does, how does Project Hyper view the need for improved information, information sharing among companies? What does that look like for you? 
Well, firstly, I'll say collision avoidance depends upon having propulsion in, in most cases. And the Kuiper system has propulsion in order to avoid collisions and, and to orbit rays and, and deorbit. Um, we think that all satellites operating at altitudes above 400 kilometers, which is the approximate altitude of the International Space Station, should have propulsion so that they can avoid collisions. Um, in terms of data, it's important to register satellites and get that catalog updated at the soonest possible moment, and, and we'll be doing that and to use all available sources of information, both government and commercial. Where commercial sources of data are available and you know, perhaps governments will be integrating that kind of data into the space situational awareness um, basic data that they provide to industry free, we have better knowledge to on which to make decisions and, and have, have less risk. I'd say the other thing is to design for prompt disposal after the mission is complete and to, and to really consider the full life cycle of, of the satellite from the time that you build it until the time that you retire it. Make sure that you can bring it back down to Earth safely. Yeah. So it's interesting what you say about that compatibility, right? It's not going to be either or. You know, it's the mm -hmm. importance, and we, we've heard about this in some of our other panels, of a variety of data sources that's going to allow us to actually create a solution that works for everybody. You know, I think that we've seen that in the last two days, and that's really emphasized by what you're saying. Um, so I have another question for both of you, actually. Um, there's another important area of space sustainability, one that's often overlooked. And I actually noticed we got an audience question um, about this as well, but you'll be happy to know I had it in the list anyway. Um, given, you know, so that's spectrum. Um, you know, given the, the exciting and the rapid growth of the commercial satellite sector, um, can strain spectrum allowance? What do you see as the major challenges regarding spectrum use in the future? You know, how can we address that area? Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Maurizio. So, yeah, <laughs> you can the name, right? So, um, that is one of the hottest topics. Uh, so, constellations uh, uh, are built on spectrum. So, that is the foundation of, uh, of any constellation business. And uh, it's, um, it's quite clear that uh, um, uh, there is a limited number of constellations that will be able you know, to, uh, to really operate with the spectrum that uh, within the spectrum that is currently available. So um, there's a first mover advantage that, uh, that that's for sure. Um, and, uh, and these the reasons why you know, not only coordination is key, but also the technological advancement is key because I, I like to use the analogy of, uh, of real estate. So um, uh, if you have you know, a limited uh, amount of land available, uh, whether it's uh, New York City, City of London, or, uh, or Monte Carlo, uh, if you want to start building more and more, you have to, to move up. So same for frequency. So this is the reason why the tendency is to, to start moving up in frequency. Um, there's been an announcement uh, about uh, going up using you know, E-band. Uh, we're gonna uh, likely move up in frequency as well uh, for uh, some elements of our constellation uh, with, uh, with generation two. So, but again, uh, coordination becomes, uh, becomes key. Uh, first mover advantage is obviously key. And uh, also what is important is uh, technological advancement. So um, uh, is, is, is really intimately linked with, uh, with coordination of spectrum. And yeah, exactly. It's not either or, it's gonna be a combination of things. Absolutely. How do you guys view it at Project Hyper? The demand for bandwidth just keeps growing and the pressure on the spectrum allocations is absolutely immense these days. All, Really all satellite spectrum is shared spectrum, whether that's with other satellite systems or with terrestrial systems, usually both. And the rules that were put in place for non-geostationary systems were put in place internationally over 20 years ago. Um, I'll date myself, but I'll admit that I was at the 1997 and 2000 World Radio Conference 
scientists working on equivalent power flux density limits to enable non-geostationary systems in the KU and KA band to share with geostationary satellite systems. So those same EPFD limits that we adopted at WRC 2000 uh, are in effect. And that takes care of sharing between geos and non-geostationary systems. But as Maurizio noted, we have to coordinate with each other. And that is a complex process um, because we're both moving all the time and figuring out how to reach coordination agreement requires a lot of hard work and, and um, good intent on both of our sides in order to get, to get there. But it works yeah, at the, at the end of the day. Um, it's Im really important that as we mature the technology and, and evolve designs that spectrum efficiency is foremost in our minds and that we're thinking about you know, small spot beams, spectrum reuse, the ability to be agile um, as we're sharing with other users, especially non-geostationary systems, and look for ways to establish permissible interference levels that allow us to come to a common baseline uh, for our agreements. Yeah, I like to think of it sometimes as the policy can move slow. I mean, that's a, it's a great way of thinking about it, you know, that we are dealing with something that is you know, not up to date in the way that it needs to be, but that it's also about technology. That it, again, it's a theme that it's, we have to be looking at all these solutions. There is no one single way to address space sustainability. We need to be looking at it and attacking it from so many different ways. Um, so thank you for that. I know some, I, I find there are two types of people in the space industry, those who are very interested in spectrum and those who like to pretend it's not a problem. So I, I had to ask about this because it is really important as you, you both just, just said. Um, so for Maurizio, in an interview last year with Space News, your CEO, uh, Neil Masterson, who we saw briefly earlier today, he stressed the importance of industry collaboration, responsible behavior, and how this can complement regulatory efforts to ensure space sustainability. But what does that balance actually look like? You know, Julie earlier mentioned the convening power of government is one important aspect of that. But, but what does that balance look like for you? Where is there a need for additional regulation and, and where should industry lead the way? Mm -hmm. So um, normally in uh, the way we interface with, uh, with national regulatory body, we're not too, too prescriptive. And obviously, um, we have to uh, align and comply with, uh, with national regulations uh, for uh, the markets we, we want to, to operate in. Um, this said, you know, we, we try to be um, as vocal as possible. And uh, actually, this week, last week, we released uh, our uh, responsible space white paper, um, which is um, really uh, summarizing uh, our key principles and what we would like to suggest the regulatory body you know, start looking into and implement uh, uh, in order to ensure um, a responsible and sustainable use of space as, as natural resource. And uh, we, the reason why we released this, this white paper is that we would like to use these in our conversations with, uh, with, the, with the key uh, regulatory stakeholders. Uh, and really outlines you know, uh, about 20 key guidelines that, that we would like the space community to, to act uh, on. Um, and uh, um, last but not least, there's an element that we would like uh, uh, um, the national regulators, so we'd like to urge them to, to start the thinking, which is the size of um, um, sovereign-backed constellation, which is um, a number, uh, an element, uh, the, the sheer number of satellites that are going to be launched in space, that uh, regardless whether we're going to do it sustainably or not, responsibly or not, it's something that we need to address together as a, as a community. Okay. Um, similar but different question, Julie. So your counterpart, our, uh, your, your colleague, Cal Pak, Guid, recently commented on this issue as well. And what he said was that he highlighted the need for public-private partnerships. And as you mentioned earlier, government convened industry groups, uh, particularly around standards development and other issues. You know, he pointed out also a really important point that space sustainability issues are not confined to one country, which we're seeing here. I mean, we have folks 
from all over Europe, the US, the UK, Africa, Asia, um, who, who really, really committed and interested and, and worried about the problem. Um, so can you tell us more about what kinds of government-led solutions you would like to see if space sustainability is a global issue? How can global forums help advance this issue? I think that global forums like this one can help advance the conversation and a common understanding of how to move forward together in unison. Um, we heard today about the importance of speaking with one voice. It's also so important that on the government side, that governments come to a, a common understanding because we're global systems. And it's very difficult if there is a patchwork of norms or standards or rules um, to adapt to each different environment. So I, I would say a coordinated effort on that. It's important for government to also to invest in space situational awareness technology to improve the ability to track small objects, to give faster data with more precision. We also heard today that um, you, you take four people in a room and they've all got their own data sources and they differ in substantial ways and the calculations that are derived from those data sources yield different results. So having, co coming into consensus on norms for data, having more precise data, I think is a very important role for government. And then that convening power that, that governments have to develop the norms. All right. Well, I know you're all waiting for this, um, but I want to turn to the audience portion of our questions. Uh, we have some great ones coming in, some of them touching on topics. Um, I'm going to jump one in to, had it picked out, there it is. Um, this is kind of interesting, you, you touched on this a little earlier, but the, the how space sustainability plays into a business case. And so there's a couple of questions here on that. Um, one of them is, so the theme of a healthy commercial competition was actually raised on a panel that we had earlier today on lunar governance. And they're asking, do you agree that competition between countries like, or countries, companies like yours does that help advance sustainability? You know, do you think that it helps keep you accountable? Or do you think that there's a risk that a less sustainable actor might beat you to the finish line? Like, how do you view competition and sustainability? Um, Mauricio, you're smiling, so yeah. I'm gonna go to you first. I, I do like competition because it uh, pushes for, uh, makes you uncomfortable to a certain extent, right? And uh, pushes you to think, and uh, not to, to take anything for granted. I think that, uh, if you only had you know, one solution, Mon monopolistic scenarios are never good. Uh, not for business, uh, not for innovation, uh, not for responsible and sustainable behavior. So I think actually um, it's, um, it's a stimulus in order to uh, think more responsibly and uh, to um, use technology and innovation in, in a positive way. Okay, what do you think, Julie? I like competition as well. It, ke it absolutely keeps you on your toes. It inspires innovation, and it brings lower prices to consumers and better products. And so it's, it's essential, and I think that that applies in this area as well. Social consciousness is very high today, and I think that a company who disregards space sustainability is not going to be a company that consumers want to do business with. It's interesting you said that because your companies actually are quite a forward-facing or, or will be, you know, as you, you expand your services, you're quite a forward-facing part of our industry. I, I have to admit, I, I was home talking to my parents and, and they were more aware of what companies like yours are doing than many of the others because it has a bit more of a direct link to service in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it, I think what you're saying about consumers is a really interesting point that we don't get into very often, that it's not just ourselves. And you know, we heard yesterday in our media panel, you know, kind of the, the, the media world online. It's, it's actual consumers who have a say in this. Um, so I think that's a really great point. Um, Here's another one, kind of related, but a little different, um, and kind of a key to my heart since I work for an organization that only focuses 
on space sustainability. So this question is, where does space sustainability sit in terms of other commercial, technological, and strategic priorities that you might have as a business? Um, you know, you've both said where companies are committed to it, but you know, where does it rank in terms of your other priorities? Oh, who wants to go first? All right. I'll go. It's in the forefront because if we don't have sustainable space, the orbits to which we're going to deploy our satellites will not be usable. And if that happens, then the services that we're bringing to customers, low cost, high speed broadband, uh, are going to be impaired if, if even possible, so. It's, it's a must have, not a must nice have. To have. Awesome. What do you think? Fully, fully agree. So is uh, is really doing the right things now in order to to be able to to use space in the future. Um, unfortunately, space is unforgiving, so um, uh, we really need to to think uh, to think ahead. And uh, there are ways, as you know, both our companies are demonstrating to act responsibly and at the same time be successful. So it's not either or. I mean, I, as a space enthusiast, that's so important to me, right? And to, to so many people that we all get really excited about this, and that's great. Um, but we do want to make sure that what we're doing has that benefit. I mean, I, I think people assume that we care. Sometimes we say this is, you know, we care about space sustainability not because space is cool, but because we're actually doing all these things that we need in it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, we asked, this is a kind of a paired question to one of the things we talked about earlier. Uh, so I asked you about um, active debris removal, but there's a question here about Project Kuiper's plans on that, and, and you briefly touched on that earlier, but you know, what are you guys looking at for, for are, you know, are you, tell me a little bit more about your views on, on active debris removal, uh, particularly, you know, given certain orbits. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier we chose our orbits, the highest of which is 630 kilometers in part because of space sustainability. So we can actively remove our satellites from orbit using propulsion at the end of life. So in, in that sense, we're not using a third party to do active debris removal. We're act we are the active debris remover. Um, at that altitude, our satellites will, through, through atmospheric, forces at deorbit in less than 10 years. So okay. that's. I have to admit, I'm not the most uh, technical of people. So I, I, I encourage, yeah, I mean, that's what we need to know. This is where we're exploring yeah. what it, what's happening. Yeah, I, I think the, the most important thing is using propulsion it, to remove a satellite from orbit is active debris Great. removal. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's how we think about that word. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it can be really fun to get caught up in the really neat technologies that are coming from some yeah. of our friends sitting in the audience. Um, but you're, you know, it's, it's a great point, Julie. Um, we've got a couple, of, few more questions. I'm going to do a couple of technical ones and one political, not technical, but one political one. Um, so we actually had a keynote yesterday, uh, virtual. Unfortunately, um, Director Dalbella wasn't able to join us in person, but it was his first opportunity to talk about their plans. And so one of the questions that we have here is kind of, let's see what industry's response to that is. Um, so the question is, what are new or improved services you might be looking for from that office? And I'll broaden it a bit and say, you know, what are you looking for from governments right now? This is specifically if they take over civil STM responsibilities. You know, you both have a lot of business um, based in the US as well as abroad. So what are you looking for in the, the area of STM right now? Should I start? Good. So uh, I think that uh, um, coordination, I'm repeating myself, but coordination uh, among operators is, is, key, is key. Um, and I think that uh, at this moment in time, um, coordination uh, uh, at industrial level is extremely, extremely effective. So it's working extremely well. So um, uh, I have to confess I wasn't, I wasn't here for, for that keynote yesterday. Um, but I think we should be extremely careful in, uh, um, in considering uh, government regulators to take ownership of space traffic management. I would really like to, to approach this uh, in a very, very careful way. It's something that needs to be 
uh, consider um, with, with a lot of attention. What is important is that uh, uh, either uh, in, uh, in an industrial private way or in, in a centralized way, we ensure that uh, um, the, the time between need to action and action is uh, minimized. And we're doing this, as, uh, as, as Julie said, you know, sharing our uh, two-line elements, our ephemeris, our covariance information uh, mm -hmm. uh, among each other and with the scientific community. We have uh, private and institutional um, uh, um, operators, if you want, helping us you know, with, with tracking our assets uh, and um, raising alerts. Uh, and uh, we have a kind of a, a red line open with, uh, with our fellow operators that allow us to operate as safely as possible. Um, another analogy that uh, I, I always uh, use is because you know, uh, we want to act responsibly uh, on, on rules that we try to impose on, on ourselves, right? And the analogy I, I always use is uh, kids playing with the PlayStation. So uh, they like playing with the PlayStation. If the grades are good, they can play with the PlayStation as long as they want. If the grades at school start coming down and they don't behave responsibly, well, mom and dad then will start regulating how much time they can spend on video. And this is what is happening now. I think it's the perfect analogy. So we have an extremely good dynamic among operators. And at this point in time, my personal view is that is working. It's not Nothing is ever perfect and be improved, but it's working really, really well. And uh, we should try to, to stick to that. Yeah, uh, we've had a lot of really fun analogies about with, with children. We had one on textbooks. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, it, it, it's true. Um, and and it, as we've said for several things, it, it's gonna be both, right? It's gonna be what you guys need to do, but then also finding those appropriate times. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to add on that, Julie? Just how encouraged I was by Richard's plans for the office and improving the quality and timeliness of space situational awareness data. I think that's great and that he's planning to put up a web API, also wonderful news. Um, I give another plug for development of better tracking mechanisms so we can track smaller data and uh, and, and I know he's considering as well the uh, role of commercial sources of, of space situational awareness, which is another welcome yeah. idea. All right, we're gonna do two more kind of, wrap. there's some really good questions in here. Okay. Um, and there's some that are a, a little, I don't wanna say simpler to answer, but a little more you know, specific. I'm gonna do kind of a rapid fire to each of you. Okay. Um, on one of these, just so I can get to a few, and then we're, we're gonna wrap up with my final question. Um, so, let me see, I had him picked up. Um, so this one is for you. Um, I'm gonna kind of paraphrase a little bit, but we've got several questions asking about launch, which we haven't touched on as an aspect of space sustainability, and I think everyone knows that OneWeb has run into some issues in that area lately. So tell us how you're approaching launch right now. I mean, that is also a part of space sustainability. Yep. So um, uh, my, my opening remark is that I think that few of you have read the book, uh, Eccentric Orbits, about Iridium, and yeah. I'm sure we're gonna write one about OneWeb one day, so I'm taking my notes. So, um, uh, obviously, you know, we've been hit by the, the international crisis. Um, we are supposed to, to complete uh, uh, the deployment of our constellation uh, with, uh, with, with, with another five launches with the Soyuz. It's not gonna uh, happen anymore. We've been uh, uh, lucky enough in, uh, in March to sign in, uh, in less than 72 hours an agreement with, uh, with SpaceX for a few Falcon 9 launches. And uh, a few weeks later, it has been followed by um, announcement of signing with uh, an SIL, what was Israel before uh, launching with uh, um, GSLV Mark III. So this is our plan. So considering uh, the geopolitical situation, I would say that we've had a, an incredible turnaround with, uh, with great support from, uh, from both you know, SpaceX and uh, um, the, the, the Indian Space Agency. So our plan is to be back on the launch pad in, in Port of Four after the summer and uh, to have uh, complete deployment of the constellation by quarter two next year with all satellites in space then they will do the orbit raising and we're gonna be 
in service with global coverage 24-7 uh, by the end of next year. Excellent. Um, you mentioned we were talking a little bit about collision avoidance earlier, and so there's a question on here that I'm going to direct to you about material selection, actually. Um, not getting too specific. But you know, how have you, the question is how have you balanced material selection to withstand impacts of small debris without fragmentation or with minimizing re so I, I guess I'm just saying, you know, talk to us about how the, your thoughts behind what you're building, the, you know, what are you putting in technologically on these satellites? I, I thought that was kind of a really interesting, detailed question. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and I'll preface this with, I, I'm not the expert on on satellite design and, and choices in this area, but I do know that it's a, a complex set of trade-offs because um, more robust materials may not demise, yeah. and both are important. So that one of the reasons for using shielding is to protect critical components in case of impact. Interesting, yeah. So we've touched on a lot of things. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I want to thank, first of all, thank you to both before my concluding question. I know I, I should give Maurizio a shout out. There was some incredibly complex travel arrangements, I'm told, in an emergency flight to get you here. So uh, we really appreciate it. And Julie, you've been able to join us, and it's been a delight to get to know you um, in the last two days. So I want to conclude with a question, which is we spent two days talking about this. And so I, I want to give you both the opportunity to say, you know, if the audience can take away one message today um, from your two companies about space sustainability, what do you want that to be? What do, what do we want to go away thinking about? Um, I'll start with you. From, from my perspective is, um, is a call for action. So we are not, he is not, uh, you know, uh, every man for himself. We're really here uh, on the same boat as a community. And uh, the time to act is, is really now. Um, some operators, some players, you know, have been doing it since, since inception, since day one. We really hope that uh, this call for action will also incentivize the rest of the industry at any level, uh, from prime contractors you know, to, to operators, prime contractors, tier one, two, and three, really to, to act sustainably and uh, to keep this in mind. And last but not least, it's just not all about technological development, as I was referring earlier on to, but also about uh, new business cases and new business plans. Excellent. I mean, there, there's some messages there that I can get behind. Uh, we are a Wong community, and the time to act is now, which is why we're having this, right? We really wanted to, Absolutely. we've spent all this time pointing out some of those areas and looking at, I mean, I think you're all here for the ASAT this morning, and that's obviously a huge one. We haven't even touched on that at all for this, this panel. But these are, you know, the, the time is now. And these engagements, you know, these, these gatherings are perfect opportunity. Yeah, so thank well, you very much. Um, but more importantly, I want you all to go away with these ideas. So thank you for that. Um, Julie. We're all in this together, N no question about it. Um, and we have to work together to meet the twin goals of having a sustainable space environment and a robust, innovative, and inclusive satellite industry that can provide those critical services that we need for, for humanity. Um, I share the optimism that I heard on a video interview last week with the founder of Leo Labs and Bloomberg. Um, the optimism about being able to solve these problems. The acceleration of technology in space over the fa past 15 years has been unprecedented. And I, I think we're going to see a Moore's Law sort of, <laughs> of acceleration now that we have more NGSO constellations like ours, and, and solutions to these issues will, will come forward. Well, we are, certainly, uh, we are certainly behind that. So with those um, inspiring words, that is the conclusion of the Summer for Space Sustainability, minus um, the fun bit, the extra fun <laughs> bit, uh, which is going to be Shortly. So first of all, a round of applause for our two panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So um, I have one announcement, and then I'm actually told I have to see the stage. I've been overruled uh, by my boss and my co-host. Uh, so my announcement to all of you is come drink. Come hang out. Um, we have the generous support of our sponsors. 
and we are really excited to welcome you all to the most appropriate venue I could find in the city, uh, the Exploring Space Hall. Uh, for those of you online, I also want to thank you. Uh, we are doing our best to hold a hybrid event. I'm going to say we're learning. Um, and we are really excited that everything that you see today is actually going to be available, um, and yesterday is going to be available online. So if you missed a bit or you were off having a meeting or if you had to step off when you were in our online community, don't forget that our, our information is available. We'll get those posted and get that information out to everybody. If you have comments or feedback, you know me by now. Uh, let me know, send us notes, and let's keep this conversation going. So again, thank you from me to all of you for being here. And I am going to step off the stage with my fellow panelists, and I invite Peter and Jacob uh, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.